Good yontif. How is it that an hour and a half after I stopped eating, I'm already hungry? It's got to be psychological, <laughs> right? After 10 years together, this congregation knows that I am a nerd and I love science. So it won't surprise you to know how excited I was this past year with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope earlier. My kids and I cheered as it left the launch pad and we watched over the next couple of days as the scientists unfolded the solar array and then the heat shield, the mirrors were opened and then it reached its final destination a million miles away from the planet. Over the next six months, we waited while the mirrors were aligned and then the whole thing needed to cool down to an unbelievable 447 degrees below zero. And then finally, on July 12th, we began to receive the first images from the telescope and they were incredible. The detail was staggering and even the most analytical mind couldn't help but feel inspired by the awe and the meaning of such pictures. So what are they seeing? I have no idea. I'm a rabbi, not an astrophysicist. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a lay person and not a professional, but listening to the excitement of the scientific community tells me a couple of things. Already in the first couple of publicly shared images, they're finding things that shouldn't be there, at least not according to the prevailing theories of the cosmos, the way that black holes are interacting with the matter around them the presence of galaxies in places where they shouldn't be, and remnants of stars that challenge our theories about the beginning of the universe are all leaving scientists breathless. To the scientific community, new data presents an opportunity. They return to the theories that they had held, and they test them against the new information. And when they find that there's a conflict, then they dispassionately adjust the working understanding of the theory, and keep going. In other words, they're not afraid to admit that their understanding of the universe has expanded with new data, which means what they thought was true before was in fact wrong. They were wrong. But there's no shame in it because it's allowed them to grow in their relationship to knowledge. Even the Big Bang is being called into question. If something so central to science's model of the beginning of it all may be wrong from the get-go, then it should prime us to ask some other discomforting questions. What might we be wrong about? Scientists teach us that it can be a liberating experience to admit that they think differently now. Could we perhaps use the same attitude in our own lives why should we be upset when we realize that we were only using a partial picture and incomplete information? Why can't we celebrate the opportunity to see something in greater clarity and therefore enjoy a more complete relationship to the idea? Well, for some reason, it hurts the individual to admit that they've been proven wrong. Causley Killam has written about the idea and tells us that this suffering is related to grief and anger, poverty of spirit, and abuse of the inner self. He says it may include physical pain and or emotional disappointment. <laughs> Not that I would know, but being wrong sounds awful. <laughs> what is so difficult about admitting we were wrong in the past and that we think differently now? It seems that there is a surrender of the moral high ground required, which appears to suggest some sort of weakness. We've introduced a sort of zero-sum nature into our relationships, almost as if there's a scoreboard. If there were a referee overseeing the interactions we have with others and our opponent was awarded a point, we might want to contest the call. When you stop and think about the conflicts that you've had in this last couple of years, I'll bet there was no referee. So, how do we know who won? Well, 
right there is the crux of the problem. We rarely, if ever, win fights with people who really matter to us. Instead, there seem to be four categories of potential outcomes. First, the one with more power gets their way. Right, Netter? <laughs> Second, the argument cools down and we simply move on, leaving the matter unresolved. Third, we walk away from each other, ending the relationship, deciding that being right was more important than our connection to the other person. Or fourth, one party decides that they're able to compromise, to change their mind, or simply to admit they were wrong, and things return to a healthy state in the relationship. Generally, I would argue that number four is both the least likely outcome and the preferable resolution. So let's spend a little time thinking about how we might achieve that path. In broad strokes, there are three steps involved in a conflict. First, we have an altercation. Second, we accept our responsibility. And third, we apologize. Yom Kippur is great at having us look at numbers one and three, but perhaps spends too little time focusing our attention on that second step. The liturgy and our traditions encourage us to beat our chest and to say the words in unison, but they're very formulaic. We're not really given the space or the tools necessary to confess, and then perhaps to even embrace the fact that we were wrong. And how did we come to be wrong in the first place? We became certain of our position using information. Either it was good information from a reliable source, or we were fed misinformation. Perhaps it was incomplete information, or it was based on emotional information from our past. Maybe we couldn't even agree on the details of the information. However we got there, our reaction is based on some sort of information. And it might help us to remember that the root of the word is formation. Information is what we use to help us understand and make sense of our world, and as a result, we took a position, we assumed a posture, and our positions, excuse me, our opinions become the form that we take. Having that challenged can often feel like an attack on our very selves. Naturally, a human will protect themselves from something like that. It's our psychological survival instinct, which is arguably even stronger than our physical survival instincts. But as important as they are, those reactions can sometimes get in our way. We entrench ourselves in a place that feels safe and where we cannot be hurt further. In fact, we know that the more forcefully we dig in our heels, the more honestly we probably know that we are at least a part of the problem. And to emerge from that space, we would need to release our defenses, allowing for a different script, perhaps even to admit that we've been wrong. It reminds me of the poem by the Israeli poet, Yehud Amichai, called The Place Where We Are Right. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Being able to admit that we were wrong is a major test of ego. Am I stronger than this self-defensive champion of my psyche? Can I admit that I was wrong and still maintain the illusion that I know what I'm doing? To this day, I still can't understand why Harry lost the election by admitting that new information had caused him to change his vote on a major funding bill way back in 2004. He was called a flip-flopper. Seems to me the greatest show of inner strength is to say, at the time, I believed I was right. 
Now I have a fuller picture and I feel differently. The entire world is sitting here in its hope that Vladimir Putin can find a way to do just this. Who among us would not want to emerge from this place where we're so shielded, where nobody can get to us? It's so lonely there. I'm sure you can think of some examples of individuals in your life that I'm describing. These are people who are so stubborn and so defensive that they've isolated themselves from the world. And while it's tempting to think of those most extreme examples which come easily to mind, it's really just a matter of degree. And all of us express, express versions of the behavior. Turn the magnifying glass around on yourself. How do you do this? Think about your most important relationships. How do you dig your heels in? In what ways do you refuse to admit your error? You know, we suffer in that place of being unassailably right. Why in the world would we admit we were wrong and open ourselves to suffering? Nobody would argue that one should suffer for the sake of suffering, so allow me to tell you why it's worth it. The research suggests that there are five outcomes that we can expect from the experience of suffering. The first is personal strength. Brene Brown writes, a crisis highlights all of our fault lines. We can pretend that we have nothing to learn or we can take this opportunity to own the truth and make a better future for ourselves and others which leads to the second incentive, strengthened relationships with others. Civil rights leader Valley Cower says, you don't need to know people in order to suffer with them. You suffer with them in order to know them. Third, scientists find that the bitterness of suffering heightens our awareness of the sweetness of life, as we, well as leading to greater life appreciation. Fourth, suffering allows us to open up and update our set of beliefs. In my own journey, every single time that I've allowed myself to accept new information and a revision of my beliefs, I have been better for it. And finally, going through something tough, like admitting you're wrong, allows us to emerge with a stronger sense of possibility for the future. When King Ahasuerus of the Purim story was finally made aware of the conspiracy being perpetrated by the wicked Haman, he acted decisively. He had been a puppet and a weak character until that final moment when Queen Esther showed him the truth of the situation. Only then, with the full picture and all the information, did his personal strength emerge and Ridding himself of a source of that misinformation must have left him felt, must have left him feeling cleansed, refreshed, and ready for a healthier future. I never thought I would hear myself argue that we should be more like King Ahasuerus. We are very soon to enter the parts of the service in which those words of confession are placed on our tongue. The mechanisms will become automatic as we beat our chest and we sing, I, 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 I. this evening and tomorrow, take these words seriously. It isn't enough to go on to Facebook and post an apology to everyone you know. Utilize the structure of Cheshbon HaNefesh. Like the Cheshbon or a bill of sale in a restaurant, when it comes and you agree with the list of items that you've ordered and eaten, then the total means you now have an obligation. Do a hard look this day. See clearly the ways that you've participated in the breaking of relationships and accept that the total at the bottom of the receipt holds an obligation for you. If you do that with your whole self, then I have no concerns that everything that comes afterward will be authentic and honest. This is why you are here tonight. Come on, let's get started.
We're going to continue with the Viduis on page 82.